Amen. Here in 1 Corinthians 16, as Paul is signing off his letter, he's giving some very important instructions. Isn't it oftentimes we leave very important instructions with those that we love? There's some very heavy and weighty things in here, some very important things. I wish I had time to touch on them all today. I'd like to start in verse number 13. Look down at the Word of God, verse 13. It says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Now, that is the thought for today. It's about addiction. And frankly, we have a Christian addiction crisis in America today. Many Christians are addicted to things that they should not be addicted to, and they're not addicted to the Word of God like they should be. They're not addicted to the ministry of the saints. They're not addicted to charity and loving one another and preaching the gospel as God has called us to do. We're addicted to the cares of the world. We're distracted by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life as the Bible warns us. These saints here, it says they are addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I heard of a doctor that served in a critical care unit, and yet he had a reputation of always having a smile. This man carried the burdens of many other people as he would come in and he would read the chart and he would see the bad news and he understood the diagnosis. He knew what it meant, like time is up. There's, there may be no hope for you. And finally, one day, one of the nurses asked him, Doc, why are you always smiling? I mean, we read some of the worst news that anybody should ever have to read. We've seen the reality of these sicknesses and diseases and ailments. We know what the end is here. And he just smiled and he said, I don't look at the bad news. I'm excited because I believe there's hope. I think we can help fix people. His attitude was such, I don't care how bad it is, maybe we can lighten their burden a little by carrying it with them, going alongside and helping them. These folks here, they had that same attitude. It said they addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. That's helping others serve. You think about it, Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, love. Love God and love your brother. That is the greatest commandment. All of the law and the prophets is answered by that one word, love. If you'll just love God and love your brother, love your neighbor, you know what? You're not going to have to worry about all the other commandments. In the book of Revelation, Jesus warned one of the churches. He said, I'm going to uh, basically, I'm going to take away your candlestick. He says, I'm going to take away the blessing of your church because you've lost your first love. That's God. And he said, repent and do the first works. And that's preaching the gospel. I want to tell you, we all have an addiction problem. I really do believe that 10 out of 10 people are addicted to something. I do. If you would, go to 3 John with me near the book of Revelation. Go to 3 John. 3 John, there's only one chapter there. I believe that we're all addicted to something. And I want to show you the solution. It's real easy. Be addicted to serving other people and loving them and loving them enough to preach the gospel. You say, man, I've got an addiction problem in my life. I just can't quite kick it. Let me show you uh, how to substitute addictions. And if you take the high road and you begin to create a spiritual addiction in your life, you can kick all the other physical addictions that are holding you back and holding you down. Addiction really is a serious problem. And this month, I like to have a theme for the month. And I I, I seek the Lord's advice on these things. And uh, every year, I plan the entire year a theme for every month. And for this month, the Lord showed me, I believe, that it should be about health. Now, we started a few weeks ago in this verse. You're in 3 John. Look at verse number 2. Beloved, I wish... Above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. 
What a statement. He says, hey, I know you're saved. I know your soul is prospering. But now I see some problems in your life. I want you to have a healthy spirit. I want you to have a healthy body. Right? Man is made of three elements, the body, the soul, and the spirit. And he says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. And that's my prayer for our church. I pray for you by name. I pray for you by family. That God would prosper, prosper you and provide for you for all of your needs. That God would keep you in good health. And here's the problem. Sometimes we're opposed to ourselves, aren't we? Sometimes we do things and we have habits that are working against us. And my prayer is that the Lord would fill you with the Holy Spirit and help you turn that thing around so you don't end up wasting the last part of your life suffering at the hands of a medical system because your body is broken and you're diseased because of poor choices we've made in our life. Addiction really is a very, a very serious problem. And I pray for your health and I pray for your blessings. And I want to see God be able to use you to the fullest extent. I want to see you live a full and spiritually satisfied life. That's what I pray for our church. If you would go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In 3 John, he, he says elsewhere, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Isn't it a great thing? We understand that uh, as our theme, thy word is truth. For the year, the theme is truth. And I want you to walk in the truth. And I want you to understand that you should not walk in lies and in deception and in darkness. And if you have a problem in darkness, you need to turn the lights on. And so spiritually, let's turn the lights on and shed some light on this topic. And it's interesting. The Lord knows how, he knows how to use folks because uh, Sister Sylvia brought me some chocolate this morning. And she said, now don't let Pax read the ingredients. Pax is known as a label reader. Boy, and right away, he's like, glucose syrup. Like, hold on a minute. Now, now listen, uh, uh, if I ate two of these a day, I'm probably going to destroy my health early, right? That wouldn't be good. Thank you, Sister Sylvia. for God, The Lord used you to humble me so I wouldn't talk about chocolate too bad this morning and hurt everybody's feelings, okay? I really do desire that we'd be able to grow and be in better health, and it starts with some of our decisions. I really believe that. So here is the problem. We're all addicted to something on this earth. I really believe that you, me include, we have an addictive personality. I really believe we do. The problem is we're quick to judge others and not look at our own problem, right? Oh, J Jesus dealt with it. He said, oh yeah, you're looking for the little speck in your brother's eye, that little mo a little splinter, and you've got a phone pole sticking out of your eye. You've got this big glaring problem in your life, and you're quick to judge somebody else. And I've seen it time and time again. I've seen a pothead say that a, a drunkard shouldn't be drinking. And it's like, well, you're not sober either. And we like to look across the fence and say, I see their sin and their problem and I'm quick to judge them. Okay, well, go look in the mirror. Now, the name of the church is Law of Liberty. It's called, a, it's called this is the Law of Liberty. It says, whoso looketh into the perfect Law of Liberty. It's like looking in a mirror and seeing your problem and saying, oh, man, I better fix that before, before it causes a problem. Well, God wants us to look in the Bible and fix our problems. The problem is we're all addicted to something on this earth. We are addicted to sugar. You know sugar is a drug? Now, sugar is an acid. All right, sugar is an acid. When it goes in your body, it's going to leach the good minerals out of your body when it leaves. Just letting you know. So if you eat too much sugar, it can cause all sorts of problems. It will make you acidic because it's a, an acid. And acidosis is the precursor to cancer and diabetes and all these other problems. And I mean, ever, I mean, it's, it's, and then it causes inflammation and you, it, things aren't working right. So there's a medical issue with sugar, but man, oh man, it sure is good, isn't it? Amen. All right. I'm getting you next, Brother Jake. All right. All right. We're addicted to sugar even from the time that we're a child, that we're a baby. Mama's milk. Okay, now it's time to get you because his baby Samuel yesterday, boy, he was laying back. He had just had lunch and boy, he was just falling asleep. We would all do that if we could get away with it. God knows what he's doing when he makes the milk sweet. We're all addicted to something. 
You know, some people are addicted to stimulation. And I don't just mean stimulants. There are drugs that are stimulants. But I mean stimulation. We, we are heady and high-minded, and we like to be entertained, or we like to entertain, and we think, hey, man, I, I like an interaction, whether it be a banter or an argument or a fight. or what. Sometimes we like stimulation videos. Some people are addicted to cigarettes. Now, I like to pick on cigarette smokers, not because I don't like cigarette smokers, because that's the easy one to pick on. And if you smoke cigarettes, I'm not picking on you. And if you know of somebody in here that smokes cigarettes, don't come and tell me. That's happened. Oh, do you know brother so-and-so smoking? I said, man, don't tell me. Pray for them. Stopping smoking is just as hard as quitting heroin. And if you can say, hey, I've quit heroin, then maybe you can go help your brother that's struggling with cigarettes. It's a no-brainer. Don't you know it's going to hurt your lungs? And now they have those vapes that will cause popcorn lung. And maybe you'll have emphysema one day. In the last few days of your life, you'll be hurting and not being able to breathe. Man, I know it hits home. It, it hits real close to home. I've lost family members early because of the damage they did to their lungs. If you struggle with smoking cigarettes, I don't know it, and I'm not picking on you. I always say I pick on a, smoker, a cigarette smoker because we can see your sin. There are a lot of sins that we're addicted to in our heart and our mind. We're full of pride and gossip, and God sees those as equally damaging to our spirit as the obvious ones that are damaging to our flesh. I wish, above all things, that thou mayest prosper and be in good health. I want to encourage you to realize you're addicted to something and turn it and say, let me find another addiction, one that God is pleased with. How about, oh, so yesterday we had our, um, we, were, we had a church picnic and I was sitting over there watching them. The ladies were scooping up ice cream and Pax comes in and he's like, you look worried. Wasn't it you that said it? One of the young men said it. You look worried. And I'll tell you what happened. I'm sitting here watching and they had, they had quite a process. One would get a cup, then the other would put a cone in it and the next lady would put part of the scoop in and then the other lady would take from the other thing and she'd put the final last scoop. And man, those scoops were like hanging over. I think it was Miss Katie was over scooping them, right? And I'm watching these things because I just see it falling sideways and there's a line of kids coming and boy, they're grabbing it. I'm thinking, oh, nope, that one didn't fall. I keep expecting one of them to fall, right? And then I realized that she was scooping real deep in that bucket. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I haven't gotten one yet. <laughs> and my addiction to ice cream was beginning to show, right? Now, now, Brother Jonathan said, hey, well, you're the pastor. You deserve a double portion. I said, amen. This young man knows his scriptures. Hey, that's good. All right, I love it, right? We have addictions. And I know Brother Ross isn't here. I won't pick on him, but he, he jokes about ice cream. You know, oh, yeah, I'm eating ice cream, drinking coffee. You know, uh, and that's another one, coffee. You know, who here is addicted to coffee? Let's be honest. Yeah. You are. Well, <laughs> shame on you. Oh, man, I can't, I can't believe it. You know what my wife got me for my birthday one year? <laughs> because that's my joke, right? Like, Man, I'm a Baptist. I don't do drugs, but that's my Baptist drug of choice. I got to get that black bean soup, that real dark coffee. You know, we have all these sayings. If you can hold up the pot and see light through it, put it back. It's not thick enough and strong enough, right? We're all addicted to something. We all have addictive personalities. And I want you to understand this is how God made you, and He wants you to embrace it in the right way and be careful about being addicted in the wrong way to the wrong things. Plain and simple. And we love to judge somebody else that has a problem. Oh, they're addicted to laziness. Boy, they don't even roll out of bed till noon. Or addicted to sleeping. You know, the Bible deals with that in Proverbs 6. It says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. You want to be lazy? Go watch the ant. What does she do? She gets up and works and gets food and brings it home so that there's something to provide. It goes on. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Listen, I could give you ten different verses about rising early and getting in the Scriptures or getting in prayer. Jesus did it, and so did all the great men in the Bible. So should we. But boy, it is nice to just sleep in, isn't it? The, the eternal rest with the Lord, it's, it's like sleep. It compares it. Boy, all the, all the tension and the problems will go away. You're in 1 Corinthians 6, is that right? Yes. We're going to look at 6 and 7 together. Go to the end of 6, go all the way down to verse number 18. I want to talk about those that are addicted to sensual pleasure. This is a real problem today. 
Look at verse 18. Flee fornication. Okay, those are sensual sins of the flesh. Things that belong in a marriage. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man does is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Now this is why people that sleep around a lot and have that relationship outside of marriage, they have problems in their body. Syphilis, AIDS, all, I mean, there's just, I mean, disease after disease after disease. And listen to me, young people. Your body is for your spouse. You don't use it any other way. Don't play around. He says you're sinning against your own body. You really want to mess things up and have a, a messed up view on life and you want God's blessing to be taken away? I, I believe that uh, fornication is a sin unto death. There are people in heaven right now that are saved and they were sinning in their sensual pleasure. They give in to selfishness and God said, no, I'm not going to allow this. I'm going to bring you home early. I believe God takes away that hedge of protection. What you have is precious and valuable, and you need to save it for one person in marriage and don't give it away to anybody else. God gave it to you. What you have, your body makes a promise to literally become one flesh, and now they've scientifically proven it. Well, we never knew it. It's like you're swapping DNA, and there's something else happening here. Your body begins to be like that body. The Lord doesn't want us joined to a harlot, He wants us to, as the bride of Christ, present ourselves pure before him. Look what he says in verse 19. He says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Okay, God gave you your body. It doesn't belong to you. Now that you're saved, especially the Holy Spirit has moved inside to you. And he says he owns your body. He owns your spirit. He owns your soul. He's purchased you with his own blood. And God forbid you would take it and use it in an inappropriate way that God will ultimately judge. God forbid. You're not your own. Your body is the temple. Look at verse 20. For ye are bought with a price... Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. What is the purpose of my life? To glorify God. What will I do in eternity when I get to heaven? You will glorify God. And here's the problem. My flesh is addicted to things and it wants to do things that may not, may not always be good for it. But you know, if I can get addicted to serving God and serving others and pleasing Him while I'm here, instead of trying to please myself or others then I do have a greater reward to look forward to. He says at the end of this chapter again, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now look at this thought as he continues into the next chapter. Look at how he says this in chapter 7, verse number 1. Look what he says. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. This is a strong statement, guys. God knows what he's doing here. He understands that women are stimulated by touch and men are stimulated by look in a certain way. He's made us different. And he's warning us here, don't touch a woman. I want you to understand how, how great of an issue this is with God. Concerning, the, Read it again with me. Concerning the things whereof he wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. He says, hands off. That means no hugs to somebody that doesn't belong to you. And listen, this, this, needs, to, this needs to be taken very seriously. No uh, brother, sister, hugs. No uh, co co-worker like holding hands. Like we need to be separate. You're not married. Don't touch. Well, we're courting. We're going to get married. Don't touch. Don't touch. In fact, look what God says in the next verse. Verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. God just said, don't touch, and to avoid fornication, get married. So if you're dating and you're hugging all over each other, the Bible is calling that fornication. You're touching in a sensual way to stimulate the senses. You can't tell me you're walking in the Spirit while you're doing that. Besides, how many of you men in here would it make your hair stand up if you walk in and your wife is giving some big hug to another man? Oh, no, it, it was nothing. No, it, it was something. God made us this way. 
And he made an appropriate way and place and purpose for it. In fact, he tells us in the next verse, verse 3, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. God allows touch, but it's in the marriage in the right way. It's a two-way street. In fact, he commands it. He's literally saying, love your wife in every way, body, soul, and spirit. And, and wife, love your husband in every way, body, soul, and spirit. You guys need to come together and work together so that the other one is not tempted. This is God's command. If you will, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. In Hebrews 13, he says, Marriage is honorable in all, in the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Keep it right in the marriage. Keep everything else out. Don't touch. Don't touch. It's not appropriate. God calls it fornication. When you're touching somebody you're not married to. This is kind of a big deal. We are addicted in the senses. We have pleasure receptors in our brain. God made us a certain way. So he's given us warnings. Hey, this is good for you. Don't destroy your body. You're going to sin against your own body. And you're sinning against the Holy Spirit that wants to live in you and wants you to be a pure vessel so he can use you. That's his plan. As you're going to Ecclesiastes 10, let me bring up drinking real quick. In Proverbs 23, he warns, he says, Look not thou upon the wine. He says, don't even look at it. It biteth like a serpent. It stingeth like an adder. It's literally a poison, and your body is like putting itself... It's trying to put itself on defense to knock you out so you don't kill yourself with the poison. He continues, They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. I woke up and I was beat. They have beaten me and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. I want you to understand that the addictive nature of human beings, you are addicted to something. And if you go down that path of drinking, you're going to get addicted to it and you won't be able to function without it. There are some people that are not happy through the day just because they say, well, I just drink one a day, but I can't wait to get to that one. And of course it turns into two. It's the same pathway with drugs for years. Oh, well, they say marijuana is a gateway drug. No, it's not. It should be legal as long as the government gets their cut. Don't they do that with all the best drugs? Tobacco, alcohol, marijuana, heroin, the pills. The government wants their cut, don't they? Isn't that interesting? It's sad because it's very dangerous knowing that we have an addictive personality. Every one of us does. And any doctor that would just give a pill to somebody like, now be careful, this is going to ruin your life if you, take, if you get used to it. Man, oh man, I'd say, maybe, maybe I need to feel the pain. Look, I know we need medications. I'm not opposed to health care. But if your car had a check engine light, you wouldn't put duct tape over it just to mask it and hide it. You would probably want to get it checked out and get the real issue dealt with. I want to talk about being addicted to eating and drinking. You're in Ecclesiastes 10, if you would find verse number 16. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, look at verse 16. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. Now, wait a minute. Is it a sin to eat breakfast? Not really. There's an argument here that sometimes uh, intermittent fasting is a good health thing. But continue reading in verse 17. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. Well, now this is fascinating. He's saying we can be drunk off food. Hey, we can be drunk off that marital pleasure, or we can fast from it. Hey, we can fast from food. Now, let's not boast in our fasting either. Didn't the Pharisees do that? Well, I fast twice in a week. I'm better than y'all. Look at verse 18. He says, By much slothfulness 
That's laziness. By much slothfulness, the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands, the house, house droppeth through. Now, he's using the illustration, if you don't do maintenance on the building, the building's going to fall apart, but it applies to your family as well. And sometimes we let food be the priority, and we're, and we're not taking care of our people within the house. And, uh, you know, God wants us to be careful. Oh, look at that. Thank you, Lon. Thank you, baby. She brought me some tea or some, is this lemon water? Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. God wants us to do our best to keep our eating in order and not be a victim of the fork, if you will. Go to Proverbs 26, please. Go to Proverbs chapter 26. Again, smoking and overeating, those are sins we can see, right? Right? Oh, I know that guy's problem. I can see it from a mile away. But we all have fleshly desires. And some of us have mental desires. Some of us have issues with pride. There are many addictive sins that we struggle with. And oftentimes we get out of balance. I I'm proud. I fast all the time. You'd say, you hypocrite. You eat too much too sometimes. What we like to do is judge our brothers and sisters in Christ instead of praying for them and wishing that they were in good health, as the Bible tells us to. We ought to wish that they're in good health. You're in Proverbs 26. I want to talk about the sin of gossip. Because you know what usually happens when somebody's overweight? There's usually somebody gossiping about it. And that's a sin of the heart, a sin of the mind. Look in Proverbs 26, look at verse 20. Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceaseth. I used to work with a person and they were always talking about somebody else. Always talking about somebody else. And it was bad. And it, because, and I often tell, like, look, if they're talking about somebody else with you, when they're with somebody else, they're talking about you. That's what they do. They're literally addicted to gossip. They make themselves feel good by tearing others down. And that's a sin. That is a sin. It is not right to gossip. And like I said, I like picking on smokers because you can see it. Oh, I see it. There you go. Oh, there's one right there. We got him. Busted. You're addicted, aren't you? <sighs> I can't help myself. Oh, God, I just, I prayed for help and I keep struggling and I really want to kick the habit. Pray for them. Help them. Don't gossip about them. Don't gossip about them. Gossip's a big deal. Look what he says in verse 21. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is the contentious man to kindle strife. Don't, I don't go and pick a fight all the time. But verse 22. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. When he's talking about the belly here, he's talking about your inside, who you are. When he says, the words cause wounds on the inside. You know what I heard when I was in school? Sticks and stones. How's it go? Who knows it? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words, will never hurt me. words may never hurt me. Is that true? No. No. That's a lie. That is a lie. Doesn't the devil want to come and put words in your ears? Oh, well, you're just nothing. You've got this problem, and you can't ever, and you'll never accomplish. I mean, that's what the devil wants to do. And so wouldn't the devil love all the more to be able to use a Christian and their gossiping tongue against their brother or sister in Christ to tear them down. Boy, those words go inside like wounds. Guys, God forbid that we would be destroying one another with our tongue. Devouring, biting and devouring one another. Uh, use that illustration. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me. It's not true. It's a lie. They hurt and they stay with us and they affect us. And then we project because of what we heard and we, it affects our perspective and it stays with us and we think about it constantly. Words hurt. So why don't we use our tongue in a way to honor God? He tells us in Proverbs 18, he says, there's power of death and life in the tongue. And when you speak to somebody, are you building them up and helping them? Or are you tearing them down and belittling them because you think you're better. Human nature is to gossip. Yeah. It is. So do something unnatural and ask the Lord to fill you with the Holy Spirit so that we can speak life into one another. 
that we can speak blessings instead of cursings. This is God's will for our life as Christians. He's given us a portion of the Holy Spirit so that we can do supernatural things. That means not natural. You know what's natural? To pick on somebody, isn't it? You know what's spiritual? To love somebody that's unlovable or that's made a mistake. Hasn't God forgiven you? Has God forgiven you? Yes. Can you forgive your brother and sister in Christ? Should you go out of your way to forgive them and ask the Lord that they would prosper and be in good health so that, they could, uh, that we can grow together and get closer to the Lord's will in each of our individual lives? Words are so powerful. I really believe there are people that are addicted to strife and contention. Uh, you could call it narcissism or a psychopath. or There's all these uh, words that they use where they just love to steal energy from people. They love to push people down. It fills them up. That's not God's Spirit working in us when we do that. Uh, go, to, go to Ephesians 4, if you would. Let me finish reading Proverbs 26 for, for the sake of time here. Proverbs 26, I'll continue. You go to Ephesians 4. He says, The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost part of the belly. Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a pot shirt covered with silver dross. He that hateth dissembleth with his lips. That means you're tearing people apart. And layeth up deceit within him. When he speaketh fair, believe him not. For there are seven abominations in his heart. People will come, oh, how are you doing? I'm so worried about you and concerned. And the next thing you know, they're getting out information that they can gossip. They speak fair, but don't believe it. They're lying. Whose hatred is covered by deceit. His wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation. Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone it will return upon him. I just find it interesting. God uses this illustration right in the middle. If you dig a pit that somebody will fall in, you're going to fall in that same pit yourself. Then you're going to know what it feels like. And then you'll cry out to the Lord for help. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. Worketh ruin. You're in Ephesians chapter 4, find verse number 29. Ephesians 4, find verse number 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. You know, we could, we could stop right there. Boy, that's good enough. Don't gossip. That's enough. That's all we need to hear. I really think this is a big issue. I know we're talking about health, and I know we're talking about addiction, and it's easy to pick on the people. We can see their sins, but are you working on your own addictions? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying. Edif edifice is a building. He says, only say what builds people up and helps them out. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. Verse 30, Ephesians 4, 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. I love this verse because it teaches eternal security of the believer. You are eternally sealed unto the day of the redemption, until the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. By faith in His work, you're saved forever. That's His promise, and He can't lie. But notice what He also says in the first part. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. We use that phrase all the time when, you know, we know that we're sinning or someone's sinning. Oh yeah, they're really grieving the Holy Spirit when they're doing that. But God uses it in context to evil words coming out of your mouth that aren't building people up. He says, boy, that grieves the Holy Spirit. Why did God give you the Holy Spirit? To help you. To help you what? Build people up. To speak life into those that are dead. Or hey, life into your brothers and sisters in Christ that need some encouragement. Look at verse 31. He says, let all bitterness... And wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. We need to be kind and tender and concerned, forgiving one another. Because Jesus paid for our sin, didn't he? Go to James chapter 1 with me. Go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. I really believe that if Christians would use their addictive personality to be addicted to ministering to the saints, 
instead of letting evil communication come out of their mouth, that they would have the power to put blessings on other brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah, but they did me wrong. Bless them anyway. Don't curse. Yeah, but they cursed me. Don't curse them. Bless them. You have that power. You have the power to ask God to bless other people. Now, wait a minute. We're called to bless our enemy. How much more? Our brother or sister in Christ? You're in James chapter 1, find verse number 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. That's for the Christian that says, Oh, I'm a Christian, but they can't control the words coming out of their mouth. They say, Your religion, being religious is pointless if you won't let the Holy Spirit work through you. Go to chapter 3. Go to James chapter 3. Look at verse number 5. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. If I pulled out some matches, and I took one of the littlest kids, and I said, here you go. Here's how you light them. You can light it and throw it at the same time. Go ahead, see how many you can do. And they started running around the building, lighting and throwing matches, and lighting and throwing matches. How many matches does it take to burn the whole building down? How many evil words out of your heart does it take to destroy a fellow brother or sister in Christ? Yeah. And the thing is, we're probably all guilty of this. Now guys, this is like a, a preventive maintenance thing. If we'll pray for one another, you want a healthy marriage relationship? Forgive them. Yeah, but they're still... Forgive them. Pray for them. Ask God to bless them. Not God, make them see things my way. No, God, humble me. Help me not to be angry. Help me to forgive them. I know you've forgiven me and I don't deserve it. Help me to let the love of Christ work through me and show it to them so that we can both get closer to you. He says, look at the next verse, verse 6. And the tongue is a fire. A world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. What a statement. We're ready to cast people in hell with our tongue. Our little tongue, it's the littlest part of our body. And you know what we do? We can defile our own body with it. Jesus said, you'll answer for every idle word. Every little thing. I mean, isn't there a judgment for your words? Aren't you manifesting that in your life? As a man speaketh, as a man thinketh, so is he, right? And there's power of death and life in the tongue. You dwell on negativity and you speak negativity. Guess what's going to grow in your life? Negativity. Verse 7. For every kind of beast and birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. You can go see it in the zoo. We, we have it under control, right? Verse 8. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings, my brethren. These things ought not so to be. Go to the next chapter. Hey, don't curse and then try to bless. Just bless. Go to James chapter 4. Look at verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? What a statement. Finally, go to Galatians 5. I want to share with you a solution, but listen, there are many addictions that I, I wish I had time to cover. You know, today we have a problem being addicted to video. I'm addicted to TV. I binge watched every episode, right? I'm addicted to movies. I like the experience. I want to go in and sit down and watch it. Oh, there's a new thing coming out. I got to watch it all. I'm a big fan. I like all their stuff. 
We're addicted to social media. They call it doom scrolling. You're never satisfied. It actually hurts your brain. And don't give those things to little kids. It hurts their brain. They don't know what, how, what normal is. I mean, it really does affect the brain. We're addicted to social media. There's a whole generation of young men that are not men. They're addicted to video games. They want to sit in their parents' basement for years and years. They never grow up. And we need to help them to not be addicted to video games, but instead learn to be addicted to ministering to the saints, to preaching the gospel. Many men grow up, and I, I don't do games anymore. Now I watch sports. Buddy, you've traded one drug for a worse drug, I think. You know, there are men that won't go to church today because they're playing video games, and there are older men that say, I won't go to church on Sunday because I want to catch the pregame show. They're addicted to sports. It's become a, an idol on Sundays. And look, exercising is healthy. The Bible says bodily exercise profiteth a little. But there are those that are addicted to exercise. Hey, can you, can you take a picture of me <clears throat> making a funny face? I want to show the world how cool I am. You're addicted to the, that feeling of showing off and the pride that comes with it. It's good to be healthy in every area of your life. But if you're only focusing on the flesh, guess what's going to happen to your spirit? It's going to diminish. And you'll be weak. And besides, you know the Olympics. I don't know if you know the history of the Olympics. It was a very perverted organization. It was, it was, it was murder and homosexuality. It was a bunch of weird stuff going on. And we, and we honor sports as if, as if it's the greatest thing. And then I remember years ago when I was a teenager, and like this, the, the, like, the report came out about all the fornication that was going on at the Olympics. It was just like a known thing that the, the news was just reporting on it. Oh yeah, they're just a bunch of this and they're passing out contraceptives and all this. I'm like, what? I thought this is supposed to be an upstanding righteous thing. Go back to the history of the Olympics. Uh, or don't. <laughs> it's perverted. They find, I mean, they find these old paintings and it's, it's just perverted what they did and what they did and that what they're teaching children to do. I mean, it's just horrible. Sports can become such an idol that we're proud of our own fleshly accomplishments. You can't, you can't walk in the Spirit and boast of your flesh. People are addicted to that. People are addicted to arguing. People are addicted to lying. Compulsive liars. They just, they just get a thrill. They get a little buzz when they lie a little bit more. People are addicted to gambling and they ruin whole households because of it. People are addicted to stealing things, kleptomaniac, stealing this or that, but then it gets to the corporate level. The bankers can get away with it. The politicians get away with it. Go figure. People are addicted to their own academics as well, very proud of what they know and what they've accomplished. People get addicted sometimes even from with hiding from others and withdrawing themselves and trying to disappear. I want to encourage you. The problem is you're addicted. The question is to what? Figure that out. Ask for God's help. And then say, okay, I'm addicted. Now what? So let's turn that addiction to something that's healthy spiritually and physically. You're in Galatians chapter 5. I want you to see this. It says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another philosophically and politically, I'm a libertarian. And I don't, you know, you know like, you mean you think it's okay for people to do drugs? I think they should be able to do what they want in their house, but don't come into my house and tell me what to do. I grew up predominantly a Republican, if you will. And if the history of the political parties is amazing. You know, the Democrats used to be the Republicans, and now the Republicans are a hollow joke of what they used to be, unfortunately. There's no, there's, we can't have faith in politics. I, I'm a libertarian. I just mean, you know what? I, I don't think any politician is going to solve all of our problems. And I'm thankful for liberty. Now think about what the Bible's saying here. Hey, thank God for liberty. But don't use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. So what should we do? By love, serve one another. I am free out of God's love to serve you. That's God's perfect will in my life. If we would get a hold of that, it would sure change how we feel about other nations and what we're voting for and this whole bipartisan conflict that's just confusing. Go to 1 Corinthians 16 where we started and we'll stop there. 1 Corinthians 16. As you're going there in 1 Corinthians 9, allow me to read 
For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 9, he said, I feel like I'm not accomplishing my goal, God's will in my life. Woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. You say, Brother Fan, I don't know how to preach the gospel. Come back here at 2 o'clock. We're doing soul winning training, how to be an evangelist, how to go out and preach the gospel and open the Bible and tell people what Jesus did. It's easier than you think. He already wrote what you have to do. He just needs faith people to stand in the gap and knock on a door and open up the Bible and say, God loves you. He died for you. Just trust in Him. He needs people to do that. In 1 Corinthians 16, where we started, look at verse 13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. When he says quit you like men, he's not talking about quitting your bad habit, right? That word quit uh, is parallel with acquit. Like if you are accused of something and you're found uh, to not be guilty, they say you are acquitted or you're proving yourself. So he's saying prove that you're a man. Now it's an interesting statement here because we live in a time when uh, the world doesn't want men to be men or women to be women, right? Isn't this a problem? Men, do you want your wife to be feminine? Yeah. Amen. That's how God made her to be. Ladies, aren't you thankful if you have a masculine man? And listen, I'm not talking about, you know, the world's view of a narcissist and a bully. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about biblical masculinity. You know what it ought to look like? Prove that you're a man. Whoa, what's that look like? How do I show myself as a man? Well, he tells us here. He says, conduct yourself as a man. How? Well, for sure, first of all, when he says, act like men, that's to imply that you're not going to act like women. Men. And that you're not going to act like children. When I became a man, I put away childish things. Or worse than that, that you're not going to act like an animal, as some do today. No, biblical masculinity is men being men, as we ought to. Embracing what God's given us. He says, watch ye. Look at verse 13. Watch ye. Watch ye. That means to be vigilant. You're on the lookout. You're protecting. Men are called to be protectors. Watch ye. Well, now let's do that spiritually. You see some poison coming into your house? Deal with it and help them and protect them and guide them and lead them as God leads you. Be vigilant. Then he says, look, he says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Now, this is interesting. To stand fast means I'm not moving. I'm not going to compromise. I have a conviction. But notice he says, stand fast in the faith. He's talking about scriptural conviction. I know what it says. I know what I should do. And we're going to stand our ground. We're not going to let the devil move us. I'm not going to let my uh, girls grow up and act like boys and my boys grow up and act like girls. We're not going to accept that. He says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong. We ought to be strong in every area of, the life, of life that God uh, wants us to. And I, I sure physically, of course, that's part of it, but that's not it. He's talking about more. He's talking about spiritually and emotionally and mentally. Be strong in every area of the life. Do it to the best of your ability and ask God for help to grow in these areas. He wants you vigilantly protecting their hearts, protecting your family, and do it based on scriptural conviction. If you'll do that, and then you're strong in all the areas of your life that matter, hey, then you fulfill this verse. Watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. And I have to say it, men, it starts with you. The buck stops somewhere, right? The buck stops with the buck. If there's a problem in the household, it's probably the man's fault. Yeah, but Pastor Fannin, you don't know. My wife has this problem. This kid has... Okay, well, it's your, it's your ability to change it and lead by good godly example. And you can help... Don't relegate it to a stranger. Take the bull by the horns. Control your own addiction. Quit you like men. Quit you like men. Biblical masculinity also includes that we should operate in love. I want you to see this. Look at the next verse, verse 14. Let all your things be done with charity. 
Let all your things be done with charity. I tell you, Brother Ross, you know, we, I've learned a lot from him. I'm very thankful for Brother Ross. And he was telling me of a study where they discovered that a child's ability to love is that their, their, their coordinates come from the love they get from their dad. And when dad pushes you away and doesn't embrace you and doesn't love, a child is messed up. They're always looking for that love. They need to feel it. They need to see it. He says, notice he says, let all your things be done with charity. You mean like sweeping the floor? Yeah, even do that with charity. Taking the family out, take the family out in charity. Don't, oh, come on, hurry up, we got to go. And I know, look, we always have men who are like, I got things to do. They're going to be very systematic. Got a schedule to keep. Got to be organized. We'll do it with charity, considering everybody else. Finally, look at verse 15. He says, I beseech you, brethren, ye... Know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achai, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Now, in your Bible, who noticed that there's parentheses there? Do you understand what that's about? Is there parentheses in your Bible? Some of them may not have it. Why are there parentheses here? Well, it's a statement within a statement. There's this household of Stephanus, the family. This family is the first fruits of the church. They were like the first ones that got saved, and they're the first ones to church, and boy, they're, they're doing all this stuff. Look what he says, though. He says, I beseech you, brethren, now let's skip the parentheses for a second, and go to the next verse, verse 16, that ye submit yourselves unto such. He says, hey, I need your help. Submit to these people. Who and why? Well, there's this house of Stephanus, this family of Stephanus. They were the first ones. They have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. He says, they're doing it the right way. And I want you to take note of those. They're doing it the right way. And I want you to follow in what they're doing right. Paul elsewhere says, follow me as I follow Christ. You say, well, I don't follow men. Okay, so you think you're perfect? <laughs> we can all learn from each other, even those that are wrong. You can learn from every experience. But here he's saying, I beseech you, brethren... This house, this family of Stephanus, they've addicted themselves to serving other people, to ministering to Christians. He says, verse 16, that ye submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. Here's the solution in the church. Love each other. Serve each other. And preach the gospel. Verse 17, I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, for that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. It's interesting. He says, hey, there were some things missing in your church. There were some things missing in those that were ministering. But boy, this house, this family, they were doing it right. They were serving others and they were doing it by love, not to be seen of men. And they ministered to me. That was lacking. You need to follow them. He continues, he says in verse 18. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge ye them that are such. He says, acknowledge that they're doing a good job. Now, guys, listen. Here's the sum of the, of the topic for today. We're all addicted to something. When you see a fellow brother or sister in Christ doing it right, don't be envious. Don't be jealous. Don't be hateful. Say, you know what? What they're doing is right, and I like that. I want to adopt that into my family. That's a good thing. Brother Chad was talking about our Wednesday night Bible study, how he looks forward to it. Brother Ross helps us with that as well. And here's another thing I learned from Brother Ross. He likes to add in his prayer, when he's praying over food, that this food would make us uh, strong to serve him. What an interesting thought. That we can serve God better because he's provided food for us. What a great thought. I'm getting this physical thing, and I want your blessing on it. Well, what's the blessing? That I would go on and use the energy you've given me to serve you. By love, serve one another. To pray for one another. To carry one another's burdens. To go out and preach the gospel to the lost. He says that they refreshed my spirit and yours in verse 18. So guys, here's the thought. If you're addicted to something, and you probably are, and God wants to use you to be addicted to serving other people, and refreshing other people, and teaching other people the Bible, if you will change your addiction to this, then God can use you in a mighty way. Isn't there a deficit of great character in people today? Isn't there? 
Now, we as Christians, we've been given every answer in the answer book. And I just want to encourage you in this. We're all addicted to something. Instead of giving in to the flesh or pride or gossip or whatever it is that makes us feel good, I want to encourage you to get addicted to serving others for God's glory. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much. And Lord, I just ask that you would help us as a church to continue to grow individually. Lord, I pray that you would begin to use us and help us to examine ourselves and evaluate our weaknesses spiritually. Lord, I pray that you would help us to grow in grace. I pray that you would use us to see other souls saved. Lord, I ask that you would help us to serve one another and love one another just as you did. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.